Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Leadership Enigma. Well, we are coming out of that holiday summer period, aren't we? And I don't know, have you come home and like me, you've opened the fridge and you've looked at the milk and you've suddenly thought, that's quite not just how it should be. I think it's past its expiry date. Well, this is all about expiration date. Now, listen, I know none of us are getting out of here alive, but if this isn't a morbid episode, this is about us as leaders and businesses not being irrelevant. And like all of my episodes, I need to speak to someone far wiser than myself about this. And I'm going to be speaking to the amazing Jay Basada, who's the CEO and founder of Thrillworks. Trust me, you don't want to miss this episode. No pressure, Jay, but come back to me just after this. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. There we go. Looking forward to this episode, Jay. It's a huge warm welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join the Leadership Enigma. Thank you very much for having me today. It's a real privilege to be here. No, it's good to see you. It really is. And uh, I love the uh, I love the title that we have for this particular episode. So we'll explain more. Jay, I, I've given a very brief introduction for you as the CEO and founder of Three Wo- Thrillworks and in the digital marketing world. But tell the listeners a little bit about your journey, because I'm always fascinated about how we came to do what we do. So give us a little bit of that background. Sure, sure. Um, so Thrillworks is a digital acceleration partner. We were founded uh, 23 years ago this year. And uh, it's been a wild and fun journey as you know, I'm sure most entrepreneurial endeavors are. Um, I used to be a structural engineer. And um, in that in the process of becoming an engineer, they basically train you on how to solve problems, which is very much up my alley. Um, and after having my second job in that field, I realized that, you know, there are lots of opportunities that are sitting right in front of businesses and employees every day that nobody sees anymore because they're just institutionalized. And so while I was at my second engineering job, um, I started asking questions about why we were still using like, you know, archaic processes and software that were causing delays in how we were doing things. And everyone looked at me strange every time I asked and said, well, what's the alternative? And I said, well, we could do better than this if we actually just modernized a few of our processes. Anyways, they said, listen, we're not sure what you're talking about, but sure, if you want to do that on your spare time, go for it. And so I started rewriting some of the software that throw, that uh, the company at the time was using and then realized in the process of rewriting that software, I kind of like doing that a whole lot better. I like using web technologies to actually like solve problems that other people had kind of no longer seen in their environment. And uh, one thing led to another. And um, that moment, as all entrepreneurial moments you know, come where you have to make a decision. Do I want to actually keep doing the thing that I'm doing or do I want to pursue this other passion that I have? And so I resigned my job uh, as an engineer and started Thrillworks uh, with the intent of using web technologies and creativity to help companies spot the problems that they no longer see in their environment so that we could um, help them deliver on, you know, their goals, their ambition um, more effectively. And so that's what Thrillworks has been doing for the past 23 years. Um, Okay. I've been doing very well. I mean, if you've been going for 23 years, let's be honest, Jay, then that makes you a successful entrepreneur, certainly in my book. I've got to ask a question. You started rewriting some of the company's software that you said, where did that come from? How do you know how to do that? I mean, as a structural engineer, how? Sure. Um, Well, we're exposed a little bit. I, I, you know, I'm 50 years old, so I'm going to take you way back to a time before, you know, computers were what they are today, but I always had a passion for them. Um, And, you know, that that gave me the opportunity to start playing around with a little bit of the technology that was um, not super common at the time. Uh, And one of the things I stumbled across was, you know, the budding Internet. And I realized, oh, my gosh, like because the Internet was becoming a thing, every computer inherently had a web browser on it. So if I was going to rewrite the software and I didn't want the company to actually go to any great expense 
to support that idea, I had to use something that was already built into every computer. And that was, you know, a browser. So how could I rewrite this software uh, using the browser technologies that were there? So I put myself back into night school, uh, learned how to write, you know, HTML and JavaScript and really took to it. And next thing you know, I was rewriting the software using JavaScript and HTML uh, and, you know, made a pretty good dent before I decided that, you know, this is the direction I was going to head in for my career. And then, like I say, resigned from the engineering firm. It, it really is a different language to me, I've got to say. And there's nothing wrong with us being in our 50s. Can I just say, Jay? Um, we're still growing and thriving, aren't we? So uh, I'm with you on that front. Um, I've got another question. Were you always a problem solver? So uh, as a kid, were you always uh, taking things apart, looking how things worked or solving issues? Around? I don't know. Tell me, was that always there? Yeah. I think it's always been there. Um, you know, I was blessed to grow up in an entrepreneurial family. Um, my mom was an emergency room nurse and there was, you know, four of us, uh, four boys. So there was a lot of time where you had to figure things out on your own because I had very busy parents. Right. So whether we were working at my father's business, you know, and he would assign us things and, you know, figure out how to do this and get that job done for me today or whether it was, you know, figuring things out around the house because we had to carry our weight because, you know, yeah, we had busy parents. Uh, we just all of us learned to solve problems at a very young age. And that's kind of what attracted me to the engineering field. Um, but unlike engineering, the field that we're in now, you know, is a, has a lot more freedom. The engineering field, just like probably accounting and doctors, you know, there are some very hard and fast rules that you have to follow and you can't violate. So you're kind of boxed in with some of the problem solving that you can do. Uh, that was my experience anyway. And so I wanted to continue solving problems, but kind of eliminate the boundaries that some of these other fields imposed on us. And so that's another reason that this area really like, seemed attractive to me. Do you know what? I've got this image in my mind, Jay, because I've got one teenage son. I'm just imagining your, your mother with four boys that as an emergency uh, room nurse, she was probably putting you lot back together most of the time as well, right? <laughs> four <laughs> boys. And I don't know. I'm just guessing. But <laughs> yeah. Well, we, if we came in bleeding, you know, the question was always like, can you still move it? Um, yeah, then you're fine. Rub some dirt on it and get back outside. There so. you go. No blood, no foul. I think that's exactly. how it used to be right in those days. Uh, listen, we're talking about expiration dates. And I know in previous episodes, I've spoken to some incredible people uh, about the fourth industrial revolution, about leading with agility and disruption and digital transformation. And one of the things that a lot of CEOs and founders are worried about is becoming irrelevant. And for this episode, obviously, none of us want to be irrelevant. You know, I've also met some very senior folk who think, well, hang on, who am I once I leave the organization? Well, what is my legacy? Do I become irrelevant immediately? How do I have a career post 35 years as a senior exec? So I want to really talk about this, dig into that irrelevance and fear of and how to mitigate becoming irrelevant as both a leader and an organization. And you have done well to avoid that in an arena that constantly changes for over 23 years. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts on expiration dates. Sure. Um, well, I love, I love the reference to the revolutions that we've gone through, right? Agricultural yep. to industrial to knowledge worker. Um, and I think, you know, those are sort of kind of external forces being imposed on us causing, you know, humanity to change. Um, the idea of expiry dates uh, sort of came to me when we got to about 17 years old and I'd realized that maybe for the last five years of the business, so from years 12 to 17, mm -hmm. we didn't impose any, you know, expiry dates on anything. We didn't impose change. We could keep just doing the same thing we did the day before. Um, and what it led us to by year 17 was a lack of growth. And I don't just mean financial growth. We were doing financially, you know, very well. But the business wasn't evolving the way it was in the first 12 years. And if, you know, the company is about solving problems for people, um, that required us to actually like apply that same thinking to us. And so um, expiry dates is something that we came up with to act as a self-imposed forcing function on the company. And it actually works right down to the individual so that you no longer get comfortable doing what you did yesterday but now expecting growth in the process, because if you just do what you did yesterday, you know better than you were yesterday. So Throwworks, you know, came up with the idea of like, well, what if we actually just put an expiry date in place? And I'll give you the simplest example. Okay. A lot of people will have a reoccurring meeting in their calendar. Every Monday they have to meet with their boss or every Monday they have to meet with their team and they go to that meeting and they run through the motions and they have the conversations that they need to have and they move on. 
not a lot of people stand back and go, do I still need that meeting? What do we put that meeting in place for in the first place? Are we still getting value from it? Um, should we be changing anything about that meeting? If I wasn't already doing it, would I start the meeting today? And so expiry dates basically forces you to do that. So in our case, and we're sticking with the meeting or example here, every three months, every reoccurring meeting is forced to expire. So when you wow. get to that date, you know, then that the meeting on that day isn't the same as every other meeting. You basically say to everybody in the meeting, okay, this meeting's done. We're finished with this meeting. Next week, we're not going to have it unless we all agree that we're getting so much value from this meeting that we want to put it back on the books for another three months. And everybody gets to weigh in at that point and decide for themselves, like, yeah, I want this meeting, but can we change this about it? Or I don't want this meeting anymore because I'm not getting anything from it. So it forces a conversation that sometimes just goes unsaid because we set things and forget things. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We've all mm -hmm. heard that expression. Um, this is the antithesis of that. It's a way of making sure that you don't set it and forget it because that's how most companies fail to see the big opportunities that present themselves because a year from today, the solution that you put in place may no longer be as relevant or as helpful because new technologies emerge, the environment changes. And if you just keep rerunning the same play, you're not going to notice that you could actually capitalize on something that's changed in the past year. So it really is a self-imposed, um, you know, forcing function to say, how valuable is the solution that we came up with in the past? And when we chatted a couple of weeks ago, that's why I wanted us to do this, because I think all leaders thinking about expiry dates and self-imposed expiry dates, I think it's just, it's a powerful, I think, reflection point in itself. Let me rewind slightly. The business is doing well, but you realize, and maybe others realize, that you're just not growing or you're just not solving problems. And I think you said to me a couple of weeks ago, 2017, you actually thought, look, listen, do we, do we sell up? Do we shut up shop? Do we actually stop? Or do we, so tell me what was going on in 2017 that, that made you think that, that dynamically really in relation to, listen, we're at a crossroads here and actually maybe we just walk away from everything. Sure. What was going on? What were you sensing? Because just before the credit crunch as well, but uh, take me back to that time. Absolutely. So um, for the first 12 years of the business, um, I was heavily involved in doing a lot of the work. So having had a philosophy of like, hey, let's keep our eyes open and solve new problems. And like, don't just rerun yesterday's solution. You know, we managed to avoid the idea of setting it and forgetting it, coming up with one solution and rerunning the same play forever. Um, but when I backed away from, you know, doing the work and started running the company because it had gotten a little bit larger. Yeah. Um, as a new CEO, I didn't realize that like I had to go and sit on a mountaintop somewhere for a couple of days and really ponder what it was that I was contributing to the production team um, such that I could pass that knowledge on to them so that when I moved away from the production and moved into the management side of things, they still had the secret formula. And so when I moved away from the production team and moved into management around you know 2012, Suddenly the magic, you know, that like kept our, our solutions fresh started dwindling and our, our innovation started to slow down. So from, you know, 2012 to about 2017, um, we started just doing the same thing over and over because I hadn't passed this concept on to the rest of the team overtly. Uh, and so when we got to 2017, I walked in one day and just realized, you know, we're tackling the same uh, problems year over year for our customers. We're delivering those. Uh, we're delivering the same solutions in one form or another yep. to that to our customers over and over. And that's not really what ThrillWorks was designed to do. Like our our intent is always to walk in and spot like a new opportunity that's presented itself because the environment changes on a regular basis. And I realized we weren't doing that, so I, I was left with you know, a very high functioning uh, company, profitable, with a bunch of people that I had a lot of respect for, um, and, you know, very hardworking and talented. And so I was presented with the three options that you just mentioned. You know, do I shut this down and start something new so that we could wipe this light clean? Do I decide to reinvent it? Um, or do I sell this, this business off and just go start something new somewhere else? Um, and let this business continue on. And I decided that because of the reasons that I said, we love their customers, we love the people that we had, and yeah. we had you know good process. The option of turning the company back to our founding principles and like you know bringing us back to our core purpose was the direction I chose in 2017. Now I'm hearing a number of clues here. One, one of them is you went back to what was what you were passionate about, your purpose. But I'm hearing something else, and and, and help me with this. 
We sometimes call it from dance floor to balcony because I think you said from 12 years you were doing and so maybe you were in the weeds and the minutiae of projects. But as the founder and the CEO, you got off the dance floor and you went on the balcony where you now get a helicopter view on, on the business. And we talk to a lot of leaders about becoming enterprise, coming out of the silo, becoming more enterprise led. Did you deliberately do that or did it just happen that you kind of came off the dance floor, went onto the balcony and looked at the business holistically and thought, we're not, we're not moving forward in the direction that we should. I wish I could claim that it was, um, you know, an intentional kind of getting up on the balcony and looking down. I think yeah. the company yeah. had just gotten larger um, than it, it had gotten to the point where I could no longer both run the company and participate in the work at the levels that I was gotcha. participating in the projects. So I was kind of forced to take a step back and start running the company uh, from the balcony, if you will. And it was, you know, in part getting better at standing on that balcony, surrounding myself with other people that could help me run the company that actually allowed me to see, you know, this the terrain or the dance floor, um, you know, for what it had become. But it took about five years for the, for me to really realize like, wow, we're still rerunning the same play. We still solve problems the same way, but we're hardly in the same environment, as you mentioned, this particular environment, you know, the internet, if you want to, you know, like really broaden the lens, changes so rapidly, you can't get away with rerunning the same play and being relevant to customers and to talented, you know, employees. And so something had to change. And, and that's where that, that moment came in where it's like, we need to actually get back to our founding principles. And I was very clear on what Throwworks was, you know, always designed to be. Um, we just weren't doing that internally. So we could hardly like give to others what we weren't, you know, forcing ourselves to be. Gotcha. Jay, let me ask a question. Now looking back, do you think there was the potential in that five year period that Thrillworks could have become irrelevant? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, some of the things that, you know, work in our favor, and I think entrepreneurship is a healthy dose of, of luck and skill. Um, and I think what we, what we managed to get away with um, was a little bit of luck. We had created and we continue to create really deep relationships with all of our customers. We feel that that's a cornerstone requirement if we're going to lead our customers. If we don't have good relationships, they won't trust us. Without trust, we can't lead. Um, and what we had done is create such founding, like deep relationships with our customers that, you know, they allowed us almost, if you will, to rerun the same play, um, even though we had competitors nipping at our heels saying like, hey, we can offer you something different, customer ABC. Um, our customers were like, thanks, we really like what Thrillworks does for us because, you know, you know, they, they care as much as we do about our success. And so that gave us more runway than I think other companies may have had uh, over that same period. You used a phrase when we chatted a couple of weeks ago, which I, I want to just bring back to this conversation. You spoke about that you were working on problems within the business that essentially the business was, was asleep on or, yeah. or, or asleep walking. And, yeah. and I think that's incredibly relevant because all businesses are probably not seeing certain problems because things are okay they're making money or the status quo is being maintained. So again, how did you get to that point where you said we've got to proactively work on things that we're sleeping on? Um, did that all happen at the same time? Or was that a, a different phase for you? Well, I think this, this um, kind of brings up one of the things that makes that that's needed to make the idea of expiry dates work. And that is a, a degree of self awareness. Okay. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not crediting myself necessarily with having self awareness in that moment. But, you know, for a business, and so anybody listening to this, who's wondering, you know, I wonder if I have this problem, you know, in order to start tackling this problem, somebody has to be honest with themselves, and they need to be able to walk in whether they lead a small team or lead a company and say, like, are we really kind of do I like what we're doing? Are we getting the results that we expect to? Are we moving closer to our goals? And that's kind of that that question is pregnant with, you know, uh, like a huge challenge. And that challenge is like, do you have goals? Do you know what your goals are? Because, you know, if you don't have a goal to move towards, then sure, come in, tackle the problems that present themselves today, and then go home and do it all again tomorrow. And if you're making money in the process, maybe that's good enough. But if you have a goal and you know, you know, that you're moving towards it or you aren't, um, then that that degree of self awareness allows you to say, I need a new solution because like what we did yesterday is not moving us closer to our goals tomorrow. So maybe we need to rethink how we're doing things. And again, many, many, many businesses, this doesn't sound like a big idea until you realize like 
you want to like expire your thinking on a regular cadence and you want that self-imposed on yourself. So it's not enough to sit down once a year and say, what's our strategy going to be? Um, and then I'll wait till next year to ask that question again. You know, what we're suggesting is set an expiry date in place that says in six months, we're going to say, how is this working out for us? Like, we're not going to wait till budget planning of next year. We're not going to wait till the annual planning. I want to know how's this working out for us right now. And if I don't like the results, do we stop doing it? Do we change what we're doing? How do I know if I like the results? Do I know what good results should look like at this point? And when you do that at all levels through the organization, um, again, I just use the example of applying this thinking to your strategy, apply it to a meeting, apply it to, you know, uh, a client, like, do we still like the relationship that we have with this customer? You could take this outside of the business setting. I mean, I think we joked around a little bit when we first met and I said, you know, a couple could apply this to itself on its anniversary date. Hey, I really like what we've done for the past year. I'd like to, you know, uh, re up again for the next year. Like you want to do this for another year together. And the other person might say, yeah, I feel the same, but can we do something a little bit different? Can we add this or stop doing that? But it's a, a way of forcing you to just be aware of the life that you're living and the choices that you're making so that we never fall asleep at the wheel or, you know, just sleepwalk our way through life only to end up somewhere 10 years from now and wonder how the heck did I get here? How did we end up here instead of where I intended us to be? So it's just a way of like forcing this conversation into your own world. I'm chuckling slightly, Jay, because it's my wedding anniversary next week. So I'm thinking, am I, am I brave <laughs> enough to talk about the expiry? I think we're too far down the path now after, no, I think, almost 23 years. But there we go. Um, so maybe I'll consider that. I want to talk about the pandemic because it, it's still, it keeps coming up in episodes because we've all had that particular experience. Uh, and you said, again, to me a couple of weeks ago, the pandemic expired what we knew about business. Tell me a little bit more about that from a founder and a CEO's perspective. Sure. Um, so Thrillworks, as much as we're a, a digital agency, I've, I really believe in the power of working face to face. I think there's something magical that happens, you know, when, when people are in the same room working together. So we'd always been that until the pandemic happened. Yeah. Now we were very gifted with technology. So going virtual um, was kind of second nature to us. It didn't pose a big challenge to us because we we're all, the staff was even comfortable. But the problem um, is that we were never forced to work virtually, never mind forced to do so overnight. So every business everywhere suddenly had to do business differently than they had done it the day before when some of the lockdowns started happening. Now, when you know a transition has to happen, and let's go back to the revolutions um, you know that we talked about earlier. You know, when you went from the agricultural revolution to say the industrial revolution you had 10 to 20 years to make that transition, to kind of get your head around the fact that life is gonna be different. You're not working on machines or in fields. You, you know, instead, maybe you work in a, in a factory. Um, our change, the modern change, the one that we're all struggling from, happened overnight. It literally, within two weeks, pretty much everywhere in the world was locked down. And so trying to adjust, you know, in, to like such a radical change over two weeks um, was shocking to the system. The advantage I think that we talked about that Throwworks had is that we had started imposing expiry dates. So we were very well versed at dealing with change, self-imposed change, mind you. But when COVID showed up and said, okay, you got to change the way you do business, we were already kind of like already warmed up. So not to say that, you know, we weren't impacted. That's not at all what I'm saying, but we were able to pivot with far less impact than some of the other businesses that you know, I have close connections to, I watched them struggle because they had a well-oiled machine that hadn't been changed in 20 years. And all of a sudden the pandemic shows up and says, you know, your machine has to run differently. And they're like, well, we don't, we don't know how to do that because we've only done it one way for 20 years. So COVID was, you know, almost a, a huge expiry date on businesses. Um, it just wasn't self-imposed. Well, and let's be honest, some didn't make it. Some just didn't right. make it through that 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 big expiry date and i know that you challenged a lot of the norms within the business and so as you just accounted to us you had a history of self-imposed expiry dates and that agility so perhaps you were able to thrive through it tell us a little bit about people with customers and clients and how they should maybe think about this in relation to the products or service that they offer customers and clients what are your thoughts on that 
Sure. Um, <clears throat> Well, certainly anticipating, you know, your customer's needs or even, you know, creating a need in a customer is not new. I mean, that's kind of what businesses are here for, right? To create a customer. Um, but I think in order to apply this kind of um, mindset with your customer, you really need to have a good relationship with your customer um, because this is kind of a big idea that could sound scary to a customer like wait a second wait a second if it ain't broke why are we fixing it i don't want to go down this road can we just keep doing what we've done same thing with your you know your either project team or even leadership team at a company why are we having this conversation if what we're doing is fine can we not just keep doing it you know can we not still keep just doing business the way we did with these customers if you have a good relationship with your customers if you've built a foundation of trust you can say to them, there's ways that we can start testing this in, in small and low risk ways that will either prove its value to you or perhaps prove that maybe this for some reason, and we haven't found any reasons why this wouldn't be beneficial to you. So if it came to a product and we've seen companies expire products before, sometimes that's worked out and other times it hasn't. Um, Google comes to mind. Um, they will often expire a product a little hastily. And so people start using the product and then they expire it. And that's a very frustrating experience for your customers because they might be using a concept like this a little too aggressively. Right. Other times, you know, you're just rerunning the same play for too long or you're, um, you know, you're losing sight of the fact that a customer and you have fallen out of um, simpatico. So what you're bringing doesn't add value to their life, but you're just used to doing business together. And then you don't see the end of the relationship coming. And so it's not a pleasant ending to the relationship. Your reputation gets damaged. Um, and it really leads to a lot of unhappy, you know, employees and customers all around when you find out, oh, we probably should have rethought this two years ago because now we have nothing in common. But we probably could have saved the relationship if we asked ourselves, like, are we still getting value from this two years earlier? But most companies, uh, or it's been my experience that a lot of companies like finding one way and sticking with it and hoping that they can just ride that out for eternity. Well, it's the safety zone, isn't it, really? And it's going to take some courage. That, you know, that's also what I'm hearing in this. That it takes courage from the leader in the organization to really look at these self-imposed expiry dates tell the story that you told me a couple of weeks ago in relation to uh paying people to leave tell us that story um well i like to believe that this is a true story uh it's from tony shea um it, you know and, and unfortunately he's not with us anymore he passed in the last two years i believe but um he was a founder of zappos and it was my understanding that you know one of one of the things that made Tony's companies so great was that, you know, he wanted to build a really strong culture and he, that requires bringing in the right kind of people and the right kind of people uh, in part means people that want to be there, people that believe in the vision, people that want to move in the direction of the company. And it's pretty hard to be sure that you have those people on board when, you know, you're a CEO. Um, you don't get to see them work on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the things that he decided to do was offer new employees, and I believe it was within their first month or first three months of employment, um, $1,000, which he then, you know, increased to 2000 and eventually, I believe, increased to $3,000. He offered them, you know, $3,000 to leave after their first month or their first three months, with the intent being, if that's a more attractive offer than staying with the company and helping it get to its goals, you're kind of weeding out the people who don't necessarily believe in the vision, which is again, like imposing discipline on a company, which is really what these, you know, the concept of expiry dates is. It's like, how do I impose like a forcing function on the business, not wait for the environment of the world to impose it. And this works at all levels, right? Like, you know, you can do this with your team. You can do this with an individual that you're trying to lead or manage as well, right? Because a person can get really good at the job that they're doing and that can be very gratifying for them. But as a manager who really kind of understands what the goals of your team member are, uh, it's kind of our job to help keep pushing that team member and pushing them requires us to ask them to do something different tomorrow than they did yesterday to kind of continue their growth. Now, you need their contribution. I mean, they need to want to participate in a relationship mm -hmm. like this. 
but it's it goes all the way from like behaving this way at a corporate level behaving this way with your customers right down to behaving this way with the people that you manage or take it right back to your primary relationship like hey do we like how this relationship is going is there anything that we would change would we get into this relationship today if we weren't already in this relationship and those can be scary sounding questions but if you do it often enough the answers that you get kind of like create world-class relationships that other people look at and they wonder like how do you guys you know how do you guys create such a, a like a great relationship well we have the questions that most other people don't think to ask and then we have the courage as you said to answer the question like yeah i kind of like this relationship enough to do it again for another year but can we change this or that about it and customers love it when you're open to asking this question and hearing the answer because they love being asked for their feedback so i love what you're doing for us through our works but you know this would make it better great like let's start talking about how we start doing some more of that or less of this or change our product to accommodate you know if it makes sense to do so there's a lot of there's open feedback there there's radical candor so i always say on many of these episodes there will be leaders of small medium and large organizations listening one hopes and so how, how do they start where would you start them because this is a process and i always say to people i don't want them to feel as if they've got to boil the ocean but in relation to expiry dates where might a founder or a senior executive start in relation to their thinking about how they can apply this to their business? What, what advice would you give them? Um, it can sound scary to implement any of this. So I would yeah. suggest starting with the smallest um, test possible. So if you have a reoccurring meeting, that's why you know I use yeah. that um, example often. Um, find a meeting that reoccurs. Find a meeting that you've had in your calendar for you know more than a month and ask yourself like, I wonder how the other participants in this meeting will feel if I walk into the room and say, do we still want to have this meeting? And here's why I'm asking. And here's the concept that we'd like to introduce. So start with something that has very kind of like low impact and low risk, because you don't want to start, you know, practicing expiry dates with something as significant as your strategy and saying like, hey, let's rethink our strategy every three months. I mean, that would be not problematic to a company right <laughs> problematic yeah. to say the least very yeah it would be concerning right um yeah. so okay. but start with something that's very approachable and then be clear with the team or the the participants involved what it is that you're doing why you're doing that and say oh i happened to listen to a podcast um you know i heard about this concept and i thought we could try it out with this meeting what do you guys think which is leads me on nicely to this. Jay, how do people get in touch with you if they want to carry on the conversation, stay connected, uh, get you involved in something that they're doing? Best way? Reach us on through our website at throwworks.com. Right. Um, we'd love to hear from anybody that wants to hear more about this or more about the things that Throwworks can do for somebody. Um, you know, we uh, we talk about this on on the regular and love to share this kind of thinking. And you know, we would gladly share some more in depth examples of how to start something like this, how we apply it for ourselves and the results that we're getting from it. Okay, thank you for that. And final question, which I ask so many guests is, out of all of the experiences that you've had, out of all the things that you've said and you've heard, what's the best piece of leadership advice that's front of mind for you right now? Um, best piece of leadership advice? Yeah, that you remember. I think it's... Or received. Um, much easier said than done, but you know, we have two ears and one mouth and, and really like use them accordingly. We really, as leaders need to listen twice as much as we speak, which continues to pose a challenge for me. But, um, I think listening is really like a real key to, um, to creating value in, in our customers and our team members, you know, for, you know, at all levels. So it would definitely be listened twice as much as you speak, I think. Good advice, and I'm still work in progress. And in fact, if you read to Alex Ferguson, who was the former Manchester United manager, that was something that he was a big believer in as well. Feisty character as well. But Jay, I hope you've had fun. It's been amazing to have you on the show. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a real privilege, Adam. <laughs> Take great care. Join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com, powered by Transform Performance International, where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.